Of course, we know about the oil market, the fruit and vegetable market, the sugar market. What do they have in common? Buyers and sellers everywhere always look out for their own interests. The law of supply and demand controls these exchanges. The crime world is no exception to the rule. All trafficking has an economic reason to exist. A mafia, a criminal enterprise, is first and foremost a business with its own products to deliver and services to perform. The organized crime market generates around $870 billion a year. Where does this money come from? Trafficking in every form. The more illegal it is, the more profitable it is. So who are the main players in these underground markets? How are they organized? Who benefits from the illegal profits? This is what Dirty Dollars reveals. It's a journey behind the scenes of the criminal economy. Economic, environmental, and political imbalances around the world push entire populations to leave their home countries for a better future. The nearly universal problem is that they're rarely welcome. For the populations of the host country, they're seen as a risk, a danger. But for mafias, there's none of that. Migrants are above all one of organized crime's most lucrative and promising businesses. It's a market that they've developed without any sense of morality and with absolute cynicism, while increasing their profits and exploiting the poorest populations. Welcome to the market of migrant smuggling. If you are a migrant, if you want to pay for crossing the Mediterranean Sea, you are going to face things that you never imagined. This is a multi-billion dollar business. I've seen a lot of people get shot. I've seen a lot of people laying down dead in the street. You, me, him, everybody here, they have seen a trafficking victim. We're not talking about small potatoes here. We're talking about billions of dollars. I didn't want to die. 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 There's a lot of money involved in taking advantage of the most needed or the, the scapegoat or, and, or the victims. Migration is an innate characteristic of our species. Since populations left Africa for Eurasia millions of years ago, up until the total colonization of the planet, peoples and individuals have always traveled to places more likely to guarantee their survival. When a journey seemed difficult or dangerous, we always used a guide to show the way so we wouldn't get lost. Today, in the era of GPS and efficient transport that crisscrosses the planet, the profession should have disappeared. But the opposite has happened. It is experiencing a veritable boom in international crime organizations. Vincent Costel is the special envoy of the UN Refugee Agency for the Central Mediterranean situation. There are many borders that are very protected. They don't have the required travel documents they need to leave their country. There are areas that are mined. There are dangerous areas between Niger and Libya. If you don't know the tracks, you'll die in the desert. So there are many roads where you need a smuggler. And these smugglers have not always been traffickers or criminals. We've always needed a guide in the desert to cross the Sahara for centuries. We've always needed that. Today, illegally crossing borders is first and foremost a market in which mafias offer services, either in packages or a la carte, with a level of comfort that depends on the price that the client is willing to pay. The objective being to increase the criminal organization's profits a bit more. Organized crime relies on this business model to illegally smuggle potential exiles from their country of origin to the destination of their dreams. The Special Envoy for Refugees distinguishes between two types of migrants, refugees and economic migrants. Refugees are driven to flee by war, by political pressure, or by the fact that they risk their lives if they stay put. Those who are generally called migrants are considered to be volunteering for exile, even if the reality is sometimes more nuanced.
A migrant is often someone who leaves his country for economic reasons, a lack of employment, bad governance in the country. Often it starts with a contribution within the community. The people put money together to send a young person towards a brighter future elsewhere, hoping that this young person will arrive in Europe or someplace else, maybe in the Middle East, to find a job and he will regularly send money back to the country. Today, Moussa is 17 and he now lives in France. At the age of 15, he had to leave his country alone to escape poverty. There are approximately 900 million migrants around the world. This figure must be put into context because most migrants move around within their own country or continent. But when we look at the phenomenon of economic migration in West Africa, in particular, there's a lot of migratory movement in the space of the EQUAS, the Economy Community of West African States, much more important than the movements of Africa into Europe, and we tend to forget that. There's also plenty of myth and perceptions. We think that all people going to Libya want to come to Europe. Our studies show that 60% of people who come to Libya do not actually have any other migration projects. They want to find work in Libya. It's always been a country looking for migrants to run its economy. We have to stop fantasizing that people from East or West Africa all want to come to Europe. That's not the reality. Currently, there are thought to be around 200 million migrants far from their home countries. This migration doesn't necessarily go from poor countries to rich ones. The main movement generally goes in the following way. 25% of the traffic is from north to north. 6% from north to south. 25% from south to south. And 35% from south to north, from developing countries to rich ones. Not all of these migrants turn to criminal organizations to cross borders, because for them, it's legal. Christina Kanga Spunta is the chief of the crime research section at UNODC, the UN's office that fights organized crime. I am a migrant because I came from my origin country, Finland, to, to, uh, to live in Austria. I was a lucky migrant because I actually made it. I have a good job, I have a legal status, I have, uh, you know, like a good housing. Nobody is exploiting me, even the United Nations every now and then, but <laughs> that's normal. <laughs> and, uh, and so I was a lucky migrant. But many of them, they are not lucky. And because of one reason or another, they actually don't make it by themselves. And they need to turn to the criminals, sometimes organized crime criminals, who are then assisting, so-called, them to make their way to be migrants. Think about yourself. What would you do if you have your family with you? You are leaving for a, for a country, from a country which has a crime situation. It's terrible. You can't leave. Stay with your family there. You go if there is next to you a criminal who is or somebody who is promising you that I can do everything for you and I can bring you here and there and everywhere and I can actually solve your problems. I mean, I would be very ready to believe in that. 200 million potential customers is an enormous market, especially since it's naturally boosted by the strengthening of migration laws and increased border checks, in particular at the gates of Europe and those to the United States. We're in Tijuana, Mexico, on the country's west coast. Here, several meters behind this wall, is America. The border between the two countries stretches over 3,000 kilometers from coast to coast. Border angels are activists dedicated to helping anyone trapped behind the wall. 
These are often destitute people from all over the American subcontinent. Three generations ago, when people wanted to come into the country and they could not get a visa, they would hire a smuggler, a coyote, and the smuggler would charge two or three hundred dollars, and they would bring them. They would bring them, the people came predominantly from Mexico, and they would bring him into the United States to Los Angeles or to wherever they were going to go, and they'd be with them, and they would treat them fairly, and they would get paid. Then about two generations ago, it started changing. People, there were still people doing that, paying maybe $1,500 or $2,000, and some of the people would take them to where they were going, but some of the other people would not. It was organized crime. They started getting involved. They started abusing the migrants. The women were being raped. Some of the people were being killed. It was horrible. Most are no longer from Mexico. Now the largest group is actually from Central America. Some of the migrants have traveled thousands of kilometers to be beaten by the wall. This is the case of Tijuana's Haitian community. They had to leave their island and traveled up all of South America before regrouping while they wait for their potential entrance to the USA. Pastor Gustavo Bandaseves runs the center that's hosting them in an area that the local media have nicknamed Little Haiti. When I asked them why they had chosen Tijuana, they told me it was the only town they knew where everyone could easily get from Mexico into the United States. We have always known migration here. It has become more difficult in recent years because of the measures taken by the United States government. The barriers are higher, there are more dogs, guards, the police increase their vigilance with electronic means, drones, etc. They increased vigilance and sanctions against our compatriots, our brothers of Central and South America. For years, the United States has actively fought against illegal immigration. Many Mexicans have forcibly returned to Mexico, even if they've never lived there. It's a real opportunity for Mexican cartels, because the deportees, as they're called here, will do anything to get back to the country where they grew up. Efraim Guevara Galindo is one of them. They're, we're from uh, Mexico, Guatemala, Salvador, Honduras. The people that are staying right now that we're here. But I've been in the United States for 46 years, and they grabbed me, the ICE immigration grabs me, throws me to Mexico without knowing nothing by myself. You know, my, I couldn't take it no more. I was scared. For one, I was, I was, I, I was paranoid, confused, depressed. I couldn't take it no more. And I told, I had called, I had called my family members. I told them, I said, you know what, you need to get me out of here before something happens to me. So my, my family got together. They gathered up uh, 3,500, because I had met this one of the guys that were working with me. He goes, well, I know some people that, that transport people from Mexico to the United States. They charge 3,500. The work of the smuggler, or the coyote, as they call it in Mexico, has become professional within transnational criminal organizations. And as it's a very competitive market, each group tries to attract the most customers. Criminal networks work the same way on every continent. They organize networks where everyone is independent and they work together to guarantee the longevity of their business. You have a picture that organized criminals, they are like mafia type of, of groups. It's really not the case at all anymore. There are different structures for organized criminals. They might be this kind of hierarchical structures, or then they are just uh, networks, so that they are like business networks, so that they have somebody who they know who is doing the, all the corruption business, and then there is somebody who is organizing the false, falsified passports, and then there is somebody who is doing something else, with, uh, with, which, is, which is in need in order to operate the whole trafficking or smuggling process. So this kind of networks 
They exist and they are also regarded as organized crime groups. The business model that traffickers have developed to exploit illegal immigration is very efficient. They use it in Africa as well as in America. The first thing to do when you offer a service is to convince clients that they're being offered the best service at the best price. In Tijuana, this was the job done by John Doe, a former cartel member. I am someone from the streets. I am from the streets. I, uh, I hang around uh, where a lot of immigrants come from El Salvador, Nicaragua, um, Costa Rica, Colombia. Many people from different countries come here and uh, I end up meeting them. Um, I talk to them. I have several friends, uh, female friends who work in bars and I, have, I, I let them know who I'm looking for, uh, immigrants who want to cross. And they, get, they right away will call me on the cell phone and I will go and meet with them. And that's how I get the clients. Usually to bar, bar mates or prostitutes. They're just my uh, helpers who help me because they know that they're gonna get a small amount of cash. Uh, it's not a lot, we're not talking about $1,000 or even uh, $500. We're talking about anywhere between 100 pesos or which is like $5. They know, they watch everything. Each highway, people come in and go out, they know everything. All the people come to the United States on the weekends, they follow them around, see what they're doing. They watch everything. Everything is watched, everything. In Africa, it's the same thing. Touts hang around train and bus stations. Soliciting on the street is a method that's disappearing. It's become useless compared to a much more effective platform, the internet. With the, with the social, uh, social media that people are communicating to each other where to find the smugglers or what are the rules today or tomorrow because, of course, there are also law enforcement action which are trying to cut the rules. So, so there is very much of a discussion within the social media in order to get this to happen. On the social networks, people advertise their roads, saying that their roads are safer, safer than the competition. And they keep these websites up for a week or so to attract customers. Then discussions take place outside the net. And then other web pages reappear a week later with pretty much the same offers. You know, like, why don't the criminals use the same uh, technological and other opportunities than, than we, we all do? So, so I think we would need to also appreciate that, that, that this part of the of the business is changing rapidly. What has not changed are the contraband channels. So it's only natural that cartels and other criminal organizations are invested in migrant smuggling. Staying off the authorities' radar is a skill that they've mastered perfectly. Alvaro Rodriguez Gaia is the head of strategy and outreach at Europol, the European police. What we do see is uh clear links, what we call polycriminal activities. So migrant smugglers uh, came from previous uh, criminal activities, drug trafficking, weapons trafficking, and plenty of others. We do see this in the Mediterranean Sea. Organized crime groups using vessels, uh, you know, from time to time for uh, drug trafficking or weapons trafficking, and some others for uh, uh, facilitate the legal immigration of migrants, and sometimes you know, you can see in the same vessel, you know, both commodities. So criminal networks possess sales reps to attract customers and the infrastructure to give them the service they want. For the mafias, it's a complete success. 
According with Europol statements, uh, more than 90%, 90% of the migrants are using the services of the facilitators. So it means that almost every single migrant is using in any of the steps of the, uh, of the movement from the origin countries, from the source countries towards the destination countries, the services of the migrant smugglers. It's a golden business. There are many clients and they're practically obliged to call upon criminals. But the only problem is that migrants don't all have the same means. A large part of them are extremely poor. But that doesn't matter if you offer an a la carte service. This business contains all the elements to make it one of the most profitable for organized crime. The quality and the comfort of the service they offer depends on the price the client will accept. But it's a business, and above all, it responds to the market's inevitable rules. We are doing a, a research on smuggling of migrants globally, and we can see that, that it is really the prices are following the demand. So if there is a big amount of people coming to one place and they need to go somewhere else, they are, the prices get, they get uh, up when the demand is, is high. It is like any other market. It is really the same uh, um, type of a, of, of a market that, than, than, than usually. So in some areas there are re really price lists. So if you want to do this, then the, this is the price and this is the price. You know, so, so it is quite sort of like professional. It's like a, it can be like a sort of travel company. Some offer an all-inclusive service. Everything is paid from the beginning to the end with a guaranteed result. Uh, the $10,000 uh, amount is for in car. That is through a car, a vehicle crossing. And that is almost 99% sure that the person will get to his house. We deliver straight to the door of the person who has paid that money. If you want to fly in, they're going to jack it up to fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. They'll put you in an airplane, they'll fly you into where you want to go. It depends on how much money you got. They have people that work for the airlines, that work for the government. There's people that work for the immigration that makes you... With $20,000, $25,000, you can buy your green card, original green card, but with a different name. That is... Uh, many people are paid. Uh, Many people in high places are paid for that amount. Uh, uh, that money is not just distributed to the people who I delivered the money to. That was distributed to higher class people, uh, immigration, uh, law officials here in the side of Mexico, and also in the United States. So the service offered adapts to the migrants' means. And since no profit is too small, there's a range of services for every budget. When you have a problem, you have money to come. Moi, je lui ai dit, il est un peu. Ils m'ont dit, mais n'inquiète pas combien. Il est, je sais pas. Il est, c'est le, le voyage, ça se fait à combien Parce que non, je peux pas dire mon fond. Parce que là-bas, tu dis ton fond, ils vont te dire plus que ça. Ou ils vont te dire le fond, si ton fond c'est beaucoup, ils vont te dire la somme qui est, qui est au niveau de ton fond. It depends, of course, of different uh, indicators and different factors. It's, uh, if this is summertime, it's uh, winter time. There is for the for the migrants how much they want to pay. Because even in the Mediterranean Sea, we see that the smugglers are offering a different class of boats. So they have, you know, really unseaworthy condition uh, uh, rubber boats coming from China. Uh, sometimes they don't have uh, even, you know, a life vest. They don't have, you know, anything or even, you know, gasoline for, um, for the trip. So, of course, depending on what you want to pay and the services you want to pay, you know, this is what you are going to get. On the 135 dans ce bateau, je me rappelle très bien de ce nom, 135 personnes dans ce Zodiac de 50 chevaux, 135 personnes. On était dans le dernier maintenant. Je ne connaissais même pas ce qu'on appelle gilet. C'est arrivé maintenant sur la même Méditerranée, j'ai connu ce qu'on appelle le gilet. To maximize profits, traffickers use the resources of migrant assistance networks, especially the boats they use to cross the Mediterranean. In any case, overloaded inflatable boats have almost no chance of lasting through the entire crossing. The machine, the motor, was very long to to make us move because we were enormous in the boat. Second ship. Après, j'ai vu maintenant que non, ça ne savait pas nous envoyer quelque part. Moi, j'ai commencé à pleurer, j'ai dit que non, je suis foutu, c'est... Parce que où on est arrivé maintenant, tu ne peux pas sauter pour marcher à pied dans l'eau. 
Inflatable boats cannot venture into the high seas, so they discreetly sail along the coasts of Libya and Tunisia and then cross into international waters as soon as possible. The captains then use satellite phones to call the boats they're near for help. Donc moi je me rends compte, je vois que le chauffeur, le, le pilote, il fait sortir son téléphone. Il a un téléphone, je ne sais même pas, le téléphone c'est... En gros, ce n'est pas un téléphone, c'est un téléphone qui capte des réseaux partout. Moi, ça m'a dépassé, je vois maintenant, il fait ce téléphone là maintenant, il appelle maintenant. Mais ils sont à parler un peu en anglais, ils sont à parler un peu parce que nous sommes sur la même Méditerranée, venez nous aider. Et de moi, là, je vois un gros bateau qui sort quelque part. Ce bateau était très, très énorme, plus que énorme. Comme du, c'était un, vraiment un gros bateau. Et il dit Menaki, ok, on vous voit, on vous voit, on arrive, on vient vous sauver. Ou pas téléphone, j'ai entendu ça. Ok, quand lui aussi, le, le pilote, il a vu le bateau venir de loin, il a jeté le téléphone dans l'eau. Le gros bateau s'est déjà approché à côté de nous. Quand ce gros bateau s'est accroché de nous maintenant, ce gros bateau, il y avait le, le drapeau de l'Union européenne dessus. We keep a, a close eye of uh, what is going on in the Mediterranean Sea, but plenty of Syrian migrants and refugees are getting into the European Union by using a, a route, not coming by sea, because this is, a, how to say, uh, the cheapest way, and you know, the most dangerous one and also the cheapest one. Whatever the path taken to reach their destination, for many migrants it's always too expensive. The journey is spread out over several years. You have people paying at every step. That means from one country to another, they work a little bit, they expect payments of money through banking systems or Western Union and others. They're expecting money to continue the journey until the next stage. But we know that to get from Brazil to here, it costs between $4,000 and $8,000. Because on the way there's Nicaragua, and you have to pay again and again until you reach Mexico. When you're in Costa Rica, the amount is $1,200 to cross to Honduras. You have to know how to negotiate. Il est question de savoir négocier. Parce que c'est la même route. Je peux dire que c'est la même route. Il y a des personnes qui voyagent. You travel by truck or boat. Par bateau. Alors, en camion, ça. It's more expensive by truck. Mais c'est. Vous allez endurer les mêmes difficultés. But you have the same problems. Voyager en bateau. Whether it's a boat or a truck. In another situation, migrants become temporarily complicit in the same traffic they're victims of. Of course, there are some cases where migrants, I'm talking about the Mediterranean Sea, for instance, yeah. they don't have to pay to be uh, transported from uh, Libya to Italy because, you know, they are trained for one day how to drive and how to be the crew of these boats. You know, it's uh, cost-free because they have to operate the boat, but of course they are not part of the organized crime groups. So it's an extremely sensitive situation, not only Libya, but as I said, what is going on in the desert. And of course, if we look in our borders within the European Union, we have some cases already where people was dying in the highways of the European Union between Austria and Hungary, between uh, Serbia and Romania, we do see that people, uh, two years ago, uh, more than 70 people died in a really crowded van without oxygen. We are talking about minors, we are talking about pregnant women, and they don't care, they are commodities for them. If they have to kill someone, if they have to put 70 people inside a van, they will do it. The reason these criminal organizations exist is to make money. They're more than just agencies for illegal and dangerous travel, because they quickly discovered all of the advantages they could derive from a fragile, solitary population who would never complain to the authorities, no matter what. This is the unique aspect of this market. Mafias are not content just to rip off their customers. They've also perfected methods to turn them into merchandise.
criminal networks have quickly found a way to make even more money off the migrants' backs. Here again, whether it's in Mexico, Libya, or elsewhere, it's the same procedure. They'll pay the, the, the smuggler. The smuggler will start bringing them across. Suddenly, there's somebody else that supposedly is random, but they're working together with the other smuggler. They hold up the people, they kill some of the people, they charge them again. It's a horrific situation. They had told us when we were in Acuña, he goes, be very careful when we get to Chihuahua because there's a lot of kidnapping going on right now. The Cartel Juarez, they're picking up people left and right. He goes, they told us, be real careful. But they never did tell us to get rid of, of the red bags. Red bags, that the immigration gives you a red bag with your all your paperwork from the, from the immigration courts, and they give you two boxes, two socks, and two underwears for extra so you can have some to wear, you know, while you get deported. We're walking, and as soon as that white truck pulled up, man, I knew what time it was because the, the, the passenger jumped out of the truck. He had a 9 millimeter stuck in his waist, and he had a dagger in his right arm. He grabs me by the by my back of my... Uh, he grabs me he grabs me by my shirt when I turn around, and he puts a dagger to my back, and he scratches me, puts it right here somewhere. There's a scratch somewhere. Or I don't know where it's at, but right here somewhere where he put the dagger and grabbed me, and the driver grabbed me, and they threw me in the truck. When they threw me in the back of the truck, the, the, he grabbed his nine millimeter and he told me to duck. He told me to get down. And he grabbed me by, by the back of my neck and pushed me down. And when we got to that ranch, uh, they, they put it into the kitchen, to the kitchen door. And right there in the kitchen door, there was a, uh, a lady sitting there. She had like, like seven or eight cell phones on top of the table. There's like two, three bottles of, of whiskey, tequila, I don't know what it was. They had a big old plate full of cocaine. And she had like four, four of her, uh, the guys, uh, the cartel guys that with her that uh, Sakari was at. Each country, they have different prices. The more south you are in Mexico, the higher their prices are to release you. Because they kidnap you. And if your family doesn't send the money, when they tell them to, they will kill you. In Mexico, Kidnapping migrants has become commonplace, especially because authorities have yet to understand the extent of the phenomenon. I know about kidnaps, at least 10 of them per, 10 of them per, per, uh, per week. Asking between $3,000 and $5,000. So we are talking about $50,000 profit for an organized crime, that, uh, for a, a crime that the government denies. So it's a perfect crime to, to, to kidnap migrants. The government said that it's not happening. At the time when they were beating them up so damn bad, I got up, I, I got up from my knees and, and I pushed one of the guys away and I was pulling him towards me and this guy kicks me in the face and knocks, knocks one of my tooth out. The, the Sicario, that same one that put me in the truck, he, he pulled out that, that same dagger. At the time, it stabbed me and it, it went in through here and then shot out through right here. There's no way that you can defend yourself against these fucking people. <laughs> you can't report it to the police officer because they work under the same goddamn cartel. They tear yourself in. Marke an soo karni talka higa, ahna lagu rechi makafe, wahun lagu amre ina wahna koisis kine, o anu shagno ina sotera lag badan iso no gu hanchebe un netili hati anu semine. If you are a migrant, if you want to pay for crossing the Mediterranean Sea, you are going to face things that you never imagined. And this is something that I personally uh, got from the, from the migrants in Niger, for instance. We are talking about kidnappings. We are talking about assassination in Libya. We are talking about people that, because he's sick, they, uh, the, the Libyan, uh, you know, they shoot. In their heads. And many traffickers are now engaged in money extortion. They make videos, they torture people, they film them, and they send the videos to the family. They call the family. You can hear the person being beaten and shouting, Help, 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 so that the family transfers extra money to bank accounts. 
Quand, moi, quand il, il m'appelait mon prénom maintenant, j'écris avec mon prénom. Il m'a dit de venir. Il, m'a, il, il a dit « Tal Zakouma », ça veut dire « Tal, fils de pute ». Je viens maintenant, il me dit maintenant « Tiens le téléf- euh, tiens téléphone, euh, calme euh, ta famille ». Ça veut dire « calme », ça veut dire appel, « appel, appelle ta famille ». Moi, j'ai dit, j'ai, euh, il m'a donné le téléphone. Je commence à pleurer, je dis, j'ai pas, je dis, j'ai pas de famille à appeler, je dis, je, dis, je suis un orphelin, je dis, j'ai pas de famille à appeler. Que tu te fous de moi Et c'est son, c'est son truc qui dit ça. Arrête de te fourrer de notre gueule, t'appelles ta famille ou tu es dans la mer. Moi, je dis, s'il vous plaît, j'ai pas de famille, je dis, je suis un orphelin, je dis, j'ai, j'ai fui de chez moi, je dis, j'ai pas de famille. Que, ok, Et, il a traduit ça en, 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 en arabe pour lui. Quand il a traduit ça en arabe, maintenant, le monsieur, il s'est énervé, il a dit ouais, à l'autre là. Quand il n'a pas commencé à me taper. Moi, à chaque fois, quand, quand, il, quand il vient me taper, il, 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 il protégeait toujours mon cou, et ma tête et mon cou. Once again, it's all profit for the traffickers. The victims will never go to the police to complain. At least, those who survived. But the worst is yet to come. Another trap is waiting for the migrants. Since Libya has become a no-go zone, another business has appeared, or rather, reappeared. As soon as you get close to Libya, there is a tremendous amount of violent trafficking, sexual exploitation of women, and torture for most men to extort extra money. So there's no more nice people. I'd say when you arrive in Libya, you deal with well-organized criminal networks. On vous vole pour aller vous mettre dans une grande maison où vous ne voyez même pas le jour, le soleil. Mais il y a beaucoup de femmes qui sont là. C'est la souffrance. Vraiment. La souffrance totale. La maltraitance des femmes, des enfants, des hommes. Ils ont tué plein de femmes devant nous parce qu'ils avaient refusé de se prostituer. Plein, plein. Tu refuses de te tuer, tu te jettes à la mer. Having arrived in Libya, Moussa didn't have any more money or any family that the mafia could extort. Kidnapped the first time, he was sold and resold to slave traders for six months. He'd become a piece of merchandise like any other. Il m'a fait rentrer dans une grande cour. Dans cette cour maintenant, et j'avais vu que des, que des personnes africaines comme moi. Il y avait plusieurs jeunes personnes. Ils étaient tous faibles. Ils étaient tous faibles si il y avait jamais mis. Et je me disais, mais s'ils si respirent ou pas. Ils étaient tous faibles. Il y, a, il y a beaucoup qui étaient blessés. Il y a beaucoup qui criaient. Il y a beaucoup qui disaient non. Qu'est-ce qui m'arrive Il y a des gens même là, ils n'arrivaient plus à parler même. Même parfois, même, il y a des gens, ils venaient, ces amis arabes eux-mêmes, et ils venaient, ils venaient comme ça. Ils peuvent, ils peuvent aligner trois jeunes. Trois jeunes, trois jeunes filles et trois jeunes garçons comme ça. Ils arrêtent comme ça. Là, le monsieur, maintenant, il veut maintenant et choisir pendant ces gens. S'il si dit maintenant que c'est lui qui lui plaît, il lui paye. Il lui paye par les gens, les biens, et puis il lui met dans la voiture, et puis ils s'en vont. Dans ma tête, j'ai dit, c'est, un, c'est, le, c'est le commerce, c'est devenu un business, ou bien c'est, c'est un macho, quoi, j'en crois pas, mais c'était la réalité où j'ai vu, où, dans le pays où j'étais, dans la situation où j'étais. But a lot of people are dying in detention. A lot of people are tortured in detention. 74% of people say they have suffered torture in detention in Libya. 84% saw people executed in front of their eyes. So there are terrible conditions in Libyan prisons, either in the hands of the authorities or in the hands of the traffickers. Just concerning Libya, The High Commissioner for Refugees estimates that only 20% of the migrants arriving in Libya make it to the shores of Europe. Migrant exploitation doesn't stop there. If some are clients or merchandise, others are simply long-term investments. People can actually travel uh, and be bought brought from one place to another without any money because because all is done with debt and this debt is the reason why actually persons could be exploited because in the destination the traffickers they can tell to the 
to the victim that actually you owe me like so and so much money, which is usually thousands and thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars. So that's why you need to work for me for free like for next five years or ten years or whatever it is. You have to realize that the traffic doesn't stop in Libya, it continues in Europe. When I go to Italy, and you can see it in other countries, France, in Switzerland, in Germany, when we see these Nigerian women working as prostitutes, who often have their documents confiscated by traffickers, who put them in a situation of slavery for 15 to 20 years, these women have 20 clients a day. This is an investment then. And, and, and this could be said that, OK, if I invest, I bring these hundred people from Ukraine to Canada. This is just an ex example, even though it has happened also. And, and then I invest that they, even though they don't have money, but I invest that, they, that I pay everything for them. But then for next five years, I can exploit them. Then the calculation is that actually the, the, the business is profitable and then they, they can uh, profit out of it. Migrant smuggling takes a variety of forms and concerns millions of people around the world. It's an extraordinary profit source whose scale is difficult to imagine. We're talking about billions. Today, we know that the traffic of migrants and refugees bring more money to Libya than the sale of oil. This is what is said in the Libyan community, so it's a very important source of income. So financial investigation is one of our priorities, and it's a priority also for the law enforcement authorities within the European Union. There is a huge challenge for the law enforcement community at EU level because most of the payments done by the migrants are by using these underground banking systems, Hawala. A hawala is a kind of trust loan. In concrete terms, it's a money transfer where no money actually moves. The money doesn't move from the country, but it's compensated by another service that's legal this time. For example, a smuggler in Libya must pay $10,000 to his accomplice in Italy. Just a simple phone call to a hawala agent, and the agent will give the money to the recipient. This agent now owns an honor debt and can ask the debtor to buy $10,000 worth of merchandise in their own country and to trade it legally. This system works because of the absolute trust the members have for one another. If we try to track the money, of course we will uh, come up with, uh, you know, the big fishes. Nevertheless, as I said, it's difficult because uh, by using these underground banking systems, uh, sometimes there is no uh, trace of, you know, how this money was paid. So uh, they are based on uh, confidence between, you know, different people. So we are talking about the payment of relatives in origin and destination countries, and there is no any trace to monitor, you know, only the statement of the migrants or the statement of, you know, of uh, smugglers. Man, there's hundreds of millions of dollars going on because that little town, like I tell you, is a small town, and just that was just one house. That was just one house. You can imagine how many houses are out through all Mexico on the border from there all the way down from Tijuana all the way to Texas. Imagine how many hundreds of thousands of miles that is and how many houses there is and how many cartels there is and how many sicarios, how many kidnappings, how many killings, everything's going on at the same time. Imagine how many, how much money's coming through. That's just the human trafficking. Imagine how much, how much money they're getting when they're pumping in all the ice, heroin, cocaine, ecstasy, marijuana, um, heaven knows what else they're passing through. Yes, it's very popular, because we're talking about $10,000 an individual. You're talking about, let's say, 10 people here, uh, 10 people a few miles away, a few miles away. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars here. I can tell you the most I've ever collected that I was paid for uh, was $20,000. $20,000 was the most that I was paid for. And, uh, the rest were lower than that. Uh, I never went beyond $20,000. In one shot, in one day. I'm talking about one day's work. If nothing is done in this border, 
Nothing is done in any other border from here, from this coast to the to the coast of um, Gulf Coast. Uh, if it's not through cartel, now there's different cartels. Uh, there's one cartel here. There's a different one in Juarez, and there's a different one in uh, Matamoros. There's different cartels. Each cartel has their organization, but nothing is done on this border without the permission of cartel or without their orders. They control the border. They control the border. What we do see in a daily basis is how organized crime groups operate coordinated. So smugglers, the business model of the smugglers who are operating in the Netherlands, in Italy or in Spain, they have close communication and they are closely linked with some other actors belonging to the same networks operating in the disembarkation points, in the hotspot in Italy or in Greece, and as well in the embarkation points, you can uh, name Syria and Turkey, and therefore in the origin or source country. So there are well um, organized, organized crime groups operating from A to Z. Of course, because this is an increasing uh, organized crime group uh, business model, uh, there are some also links with some other criminal areas. And what I have always said is that trafficking is not somewhere there. Trafficking is here. It is a problem of all of us. It is a problem which is around us. You, me, him, everybody here, they have seen a trafficking victim, probably not without knowing about it. But, you know, it is a problem which is happening around us. It's not something that we can externalize some, somewhere to the, to the developing world or Africa or some other, other regions. Exploitation doesn't happen in the illegal sector at all. I mean, if you think about most of the victims, they are actually exploited in a legal sector, in restaurants, in hotels, in agriculture. Uh, in fishing industry, in whatever we can think of, you know, like shops, whatever. And this is totally legal. And moreover, it's completely invisible to the population. In contrast, there are those who make it to Europe and who have no other choice than to band together until their situations evolve. This profits criminal networks, but French ones this time. Dr. Laurine Cissé works for the organization Doctors Without Borders, which treats patients during the day in makeshift camps right in the heart of Paris. We consider that they're newcomers. Unfortunately, it happens that some are in extremely long procedures in France with non-response situations. So they've been waiting for an extremely long time. But there are still a lot of newcomers arriving every day. Every night when the NGOs leave the field, they leave it wide open for other organizations. There are definitely a lot of things that happen underground, mostly at night and in the evening. When we talk to them, you can sense that there are things happening, people who have their eye on them. It's complicated to tell what's really going on. However, we do know that young adults and minors are extremely vulnerable and are constantly approached by trafficking and prostitution networks. To avoid seeing this kind of situation repeat itself, there's more and more talk about moving refugees' administrative requests to their country of origin or neighboring countries. It's an initiative that's existed since 2014, so that those who are forced to leave their countries are able to do so legally. So there's this saying that people don't have to cross borders. It's a crime, they can use legal ways, but finally the legal ways don't work. 85% of the people who arrive in Libya pass through Niger. How many refugees have been relocated from Niger to the rest of the world? In 2014, zero. 2015, zero. 2016, zero. 2017, one refugee. So you have to be serious. Either we set these legal alternatives for people who are refugees with maximum security control so as to protect hosting communities, or we remain silent on these legal channels because today they don't exist. The more migrants there are, the more countries will shore up their borders to limit mass immigration. It's a trend that's happening worldwide. The only real and indisputable consequence of this policy is the extraordinary profit that criminal organizations will make. By promising that no border, no wall can keep them out, 
mafias will continue to reap huge profits. Musa got his papers and resumed his studies in a work-study program to become a mechanic. Ephraim never returned to the United States. He lives in Tijuana, where he works in a reception center that helps deportees.